Hey, welcome to Class Act Media. I'm Jack, and if you know me, you know that I love sitcoms. Sure, they're a difficult genre to get right, but when the stars align, they can be things of beauty. And if you've been watching this channel for long enough, you probably also know that I'm a fan of DC Comics. So, theoretically, if those two things were to be combined, I should love it, right? Right? Powerless was an NBC sitcom from 2017 that followed a group of ordinary people living in the DC universe and explored what their lives are like in a world where supervillain attacks are a daily occurrence. I remember at the time I was actually really excited for this show. Like I said, I love sitcoms in DC, it had my boy Danny Pudi in it, and NBC usually has a really good track record when it comes to sitcoms. Seinfeld, Cheers, 30 Rock, The Office, AP Bio, The Good Place, and a little show I may have mentioned once or twice on this channel called Community. Point being, I had a lot of reason to be optimistic. And that optimism was further boosted when the pilot episode of Powerless aired at San Diego Comic Con 2016 to pretty good reviews. Although everything gets a good reception at SDCC, so that really doesn't mean anything, I guess. But we'll never actually know if that pilot episode was good or not, because after the Comic Con showing, the series creator Ben Queen left the show and the pilot was almost completely rewritten and reshot. Release the Queen cut, you cowards. Now, with all the backstory out of the way, how is the show that we actually got to see? Well, first and foremost, I really like the intro, which shows a series of classic DC covers with the characters from the show added into the background. It's nice, and also reinforces the theme of the show. As for the show itself, it follows the employees of Wayne's security. Yes, Wayne is in Bruce Wayne, and no, we never actually get to see Bruce Wayne. Anyway, their job is to make products to protect civilians from the collateral damage of superhero battles, which honestly is a pretty clever idea. Our cast consists of Vanessa Hudgens as Emily Locke, and yes, I'm aware that that is the most young adult novel name they could have possibly given her. She's your standard wide-eyed innocent moving to the big city with big dreams and aspirations. She's not the most interesting character, but hey, at least Vanessa Hudgens is a good enough actor. There's Jackie, played by Christina Kirk, who acts as the downtrodden counter to Emily's upbeat optimism. Her character is kind of a contradiction since she constantly talks about how she wants to be left alone while simultaneously actively involving herself in the plot. There's Teddy and Ron, played by my boy Danny Pudi and Ron Funches respectively. They're... they're characters, I guess. And there's Wendy, whose Wikipedia character bio describes as works with Teddy and Ron. But, I mean, come on, that's not fair. She has more to her character than that. She's very, very horny all the time, and the joke is that she wants to do sex with people and they do not wish to do sex with her. That is very, very funny. And then, last but not least, we have my absolute favorite character by a long shot, Alan Tudyk as Van Wayne, Bruce Wayne's cousin and the office's boss. Alan Tudyk is such a naturally funny guy that he got the vast majority of laughs from me when I watched the show. I'm more of a big picture guy. Look at this picture. This picture's huge. Speaking of Van, he's actually a character from the comics. Really only a character from one comic, namely Batman number 148 from 1962. In that story, he's still Bruce Wayne's cousin, although he's decidedly younger than he is in Powerless. In the comic he appears in, Van decides to put on a costume and pretend to be Robin for a bit, which they actually do reference at one point in the show, so that's pretty neat. In fact, this show references a lot of really obscure DC characters, some so obscure that even I had never heard of them. Sure, we get a lot of mentions of the big name heroes and villains like Superman, Batman, Lex Luthor, Joker, etc., but the ones we actually get to see on screen are the deep cut references. Heroes like Crimson Fox and the Olympian, and villains like Jack-o-lantern, Saw Troll, the Sea Troll, and Prince evil -O. Probably the most high-profile character we get to see on screen is the hero Fire, who for some reason they confusingly refer to as Green Fury? I don't know why they chose to do that. I mean, I know that years ago in the comics she was called Green Fury, but these days she's pretty definitively called Fire. Are the rights to Fire so hotly ha, contested that they had to change her name for the show? All this brings me to my next point, which is that, well, yes, it is cool to see these completely unknown characters get the spotlight, they're not very comic accurate. For example, Prince evil -O in the comics is an enemy of the Legion of Superheroes and only exists in the 30th century. In Powerless, he's just a villain sitting in prison during modern day, he really could be anyone. 
Same thing with Crimson Fox. In the comic, she's a duo of French sisters who swap out the Crimson Fox identity between each other. In the show, she's just a generic superhero. Now, I know, adaptations are allowed to make changes, but these are such boring changes. They turn these characters into standard superhero and supervillain stereotypes. If this show is meant to appeal to hardcore DC fans, why not actually preserve what makes these characters interesting? If not for the DC branding, this would be indistinguishable from any other generic superhero world. It kind of feels like the writers just flip through the DC encyclopedia and pick some characters at random to use. Sure, there's fleeting moments of DC charm, like a Superman vs. Flash race at one point, but most of the time it's just, oh, another stock villain is attacking, how wacky. This could easily take place in the world of Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog, and barely anything would change. Hell, even when they do do things that could only happen in the DC universe, it doesn't feel like they really get the source material. Take the episode Sinking Day, for example, where Van and Emily are trying to secure an exclusive security contract with the nation of Atlantis. In it, Van lies to the Atlanteans he's meeting with and tells them he's throwing a party for the Atlantean holiday Sinking Day and that Aquaman will be there. First of all, aren't these guys Atlantean officials? Wouldn't they meet with Aquaman all the time? Are you telling me that the King of Atlantis is not involved with negotiations for the security of his nation? Secondly, if Sinking Day is such an important holiday in Atlantis, wouldn't there be some sort of official Sinking Day celebration that Aquaman would be at? Do these guys really believe that Aquaman would go to a Sinking Day party hosted by some random land dweller rather than just throwing his own party in Atlantis? You may think I'm overthinking this, and... Yeah, I am, but if this show is supposed to appeal to hardcore DC fans like they claimed it was, don't you think they should have put more thought into how the world was constructed and presented? Speaking of poorly representing the DC universe, haha, very funny Lex Luthor is Trump joke, that is very good joke, haha, very clever, hee hee. There's also this weird trend in the show of making superheroes basically like athletes. Instead of fantasy sports, they have fantasy superhero league, where people pick superhero teams and whoever's team saves the most people in a season wins. They're literally playing with people's lives, it's very sociopathic if you think about it. Not to mention this game themed around various DC supervillains. Like, these are real terrorists in this world, and you're just gonna slap their images onto a toy for children? Isn't that like if we had ISIS Monopoly? And if you think Powerless presents the DC universe poorly, well, it doesn't present the rest of itself much better either. For a show that wanted to show the lives of ordinary people in a world of superheroes, it sure doesn't show much of their lives. They rarely ever leave the office, to the point where we never even get to see any of their homes. Well, except for that one scene where Emily's condo gets blown up, but again, that's one scene. This gets built up to an almost ridiculous degree in the episode No Consequences Day, where Lois Lane dies and everyone realizes they get to do whatever they want with no consequences until Superman turns back time to save her. But even when given the opportunity to do whatever they want for a day, most of them don't even leave work. Ron even goes to the pet store, buys a bunch of puppies, and then takes them back to the office. Why not take them home? I get that sitcoms are normally made on tight budgets and thus are required to limit themselves to one or two main sets. Seinfeld had Jerry's apartment in the diner, Friends had Monica's apartment in Central Perk, you get it. But of all the locations they could have chosen for this show, can you think of any more boring than this Disney Channel original movie looking office and the street corner directly outside that office? The production design is one thing, but Powerless also even gets lazy about its own messages from time to time. Take the episode Green Furious, for example. Emily manages to convince Green Fury to star in a commercial for Wayne Security Ponchos. But uh-oh, the Wayne executives has changed the ad to be more sexy. Will Emily allow her vision to be compromised as well as publicly demean Green Fury just so she can move ahead in the corporate world? Or will she stick to her principles and tell Green Fury not to do the ad, tanking her own chances of advancing her career? Well, it turns out there was actually no dilemma. Emily just gets another superhero, the Olympian, to do the sexy ad instead of Green Fury. And the executives are cool with it. See, I thought that this episode is trying to say that the corporate world doesn't care about women except for sex appeal, but as it turns out, they were just very, very horny and didn't care about the gender of the person they were horny for. Hooray? I don't know what point this episode is trying to make, and honestly, I don't think the writers did either. Powerless can't even keep the premise of the entire show consistent. 
I thought it was supposed to be about normal people living day-to-day lives in a superhero world, but in the episode Win Luthor Draw, the gang ends up saving the world from an alien invasion and Jackie gets super speed powers. Okay, that's really all the points I wanted to make about Powerless, but I don't know how to end the videos, so... Look at how awful this battering design looks. Okay, I know I dunked on it a lot throughout this video, but Powerless wasn't an awful show. I actually did find myself laughing at a good amount of the jokes, especially considering the sense of humor got darker as the season went on. But uh, I can't end this video on a positive note. Too curmudgeonly for that. So instead, enjoy the worst joke from Powerless. What the hell is this? You've been memed. Oh, fuck you. See you next time, guys.